Hi, I'm Sarab. I'm a PhD student with uh, Rob, but also I'm really mainly based in applied maths and design engineering in Imperial as well. So it's a bit of a change. There's not huge amounts of ecology in this talk, but you know, inputs welcome from lots of people who know a lot about ecology. Uh, I'll be talking about fully automated acoustic monitoring in tropical forests. So some sort of motivation. I guess tropical forests coming from a sort of physicist's view of the world are complex systems and good ways to understand complex systems are just to collect loads and loads of data and that's the only really way to tease out information from these systems. Traditional surveys are kind of things we've heard all about today really except of David's things are really labor intensive processes but you get high quality data so they have a place but they don't scale very well when we're trying to talk about clicks and massive amounts of data. And established automated survey methods such as remote sensing they do really great at telling you something about the forest structure from far away but they can't and they almost never will tell you about biodiversity because until you get the resolution that you can do kind of a camera trap study from space you know we're a long way off that that's it's another problem so this is where acoustics might fill a gap in our knowledge and our approach to big data monitoring of tropical ecosystems so the first question is how do we actually go about recording large amounts of data from these systems um, there are, I'm not the first person to ever do acoustics in tropical forests or even just in ecosystems in general, but the existing equipment kind of suffers always from a com some combination of these four issues, which is they're expensive, they're proprietary, which isn't just like an issue in terms of, you know, I like open science. It's an issue in terms of you don't know all the processing your data's gone through because the companies, for a good reason, don't give you all their data, give you all their hardware spec. Uh, they require regular field maintenance, you know, all of these, except for this one, which I'll quickly get to, require you to go out and replace batteries and collect SD cards. So yes, it's an improvement in that you can leave something out for a week, but it doesn't really scale well to a year. You still have someone employed going out and maintaining these devices and picking up your data and doing all the power sort of sourcing out. And yeah, as we're going to focus on this talk, they're not really truly autonomous for that reason. And if we're going to have sort of long term, really fully automated monitoring, we want to do something that is set and forget. Uh, this is Cyber Forest, which is a project from some research in the Uni of Tokyo. And in true sort of Japanese fashion, they've been doing it since the 90s. Uh, <laughs> like real time monitoring of acoustics from forests. But as you can see, their setup is massive scaffolding, satellite internet connections, which are thousands of pounds for, giga for like gigabytes. And they've got maybe five, six sites within the whole of Japan. It's not really an ecological tool we can use on a scale of safe to investigate questions like land degradation. Uh, this is what we did. We got a Raspberry Pi, which is basically a tiny computer, attached it to a sensor. Uh, what we're talking about today is acoustics, but we'll get to other parts. And uh, here, this is a 3G dongle. So it's just got a SIM card like you'd have on your phone. And you will know that it's actually not a bad amount of 3G coverage through SAFE, more than you might expect, definitely. And so this bit of computer just sits there recording data from your sensor 24-7, compressing it and uploading it to the server. And we don't actually do any sort of any uh, ID or anything of the animals on the device. We just upload the raw data, and that kind of makes it amenable to sharing our data. So when I say compressed people, I guess not so much here, but engineering community tend to get quite worried. You know, what's the data quality that you're getting back because you have to go over a data network and something. So here's a little clip of the audio, and it suffice to say it's well, the compression is well above anything that is perceptually that you could tell the difference between the raw file. And, oh, it paused just before it got to the elephant. Anyway, <laughs> there's an elephant in that clip. Um, <laughs> These compression standards are very good and, sorry, try it again, okay. <laughs> oh, wait. There we are. So that was from VJR, but I'm sure there's lots of other stuff. I literally found that just by clicking a random file and checking my recorder was working, and there was an elephant. So, <laughs> yeah, uh, that's what we've done. But quite interestingly, we've made the sensor agnostic to whatever, the, the whole computing system agnostic to whatever sensor you have. So we've implemented it here for audio, and I'm going to talk more about the audio analyses. 
We also did a time-lapse camera, so something that just sits there and takes a picture every 20 minutes. So a lot of the bulk of the computing work, the engineering work, was in making this the sort of concurrent uh, compression and uploading of the data robust and all of this. But actually, when you then change in for a different sensor, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. So anyone else here who's doing these kind of sensing studies, you know, camera traps could easily be modified. There are people who've used camera, Raspberry Pis to build camera traps. So having a real-time camera trap is imminently possible, maybe a few days' work from this kind of system. Um, this is what they look like in the field. You have to put them up trees because solar panels need sunlight and there's not much on the floor. And yeah, it's, this is what it looks like right now. This is what it looks like for a first version, but we're working with industrial designers and sort of people who can make it look a bit nicer and more uh, easily used by non-technical. Uh, all of this is here if you're interested in using the device for your own purposes. There's a lot more sort of in-depth explanation. So then, OK, we got a tool. How can we actually use it to apply to a real ecological question? Uh, safe, 14 acoustic monitoring sites across the whole degradation gradient, two in each of those. Um, and our ground truth data we're using is species community data of birds and amphibians and reptiles used uh, at a point count method at each of our 14 sites over 24 hours of the day. And also we're using Marion's above ground biomass data, sort of a continuous measure of land degradation. From the audio, you might, the obvious thing to do is you, know, you scan through with some deep learning model or whatever kind of model and you say, what species are in my audio? So earlier I'd have gone, yes, there's an elephant there. Or are there these birds or these uh, frogs? What we're actually doing, <laughs> good level of ecology, sorry. Um, actually, what we're doing is something a bit more general. So the, the massive pitfall to this is you have to have huge training corpuses of each of the species you're looking for. And in the soundscapes we have, one, well, actually a lot of the insects, we don't know what their noises are. They're so unstudied. And also, even if I picked 100 species and found really good training corpses, there are still another 100 species calling that we're not looking for. So this is a good way of getting overall metrics of what the audio is doing and sort of fingerprinting it in some sense, rather than giving you an exact species community from the audio. Uh, so these are, you know, Activities at different frequency bands within a sort of one second window or a 10 second window or average volume of the audio are sort of features that people have thought of. They've, like, domain specialists have been, oh, I know birds are about one kilohertz, so I'm going to look at one kilohertz. Or there's a lot of sort of handcrafting of the features, but the whole sort of machine learning community is coming to the consensus that that isn't the best way to define your features. So what we're doing is kind of letting a machine determine the features. So we've got, um, if you're aware of ImageNet, which is general purpose image classification, we got a, another project by Google, uh, which is AudioSet, which is general purpose audio classification. And without getting into the gory details, we get a, f a feature vector for our one second of audio that is 128 dimensional rather than two or three dimensional that people use it traditionally in soundscape studies. and. It's a lot more descriptive. You lose the interpretability of what each feature means, but you get a far better, you can actually discriminate between different sounds on a, on a respectable way. Um, OK, so start with our ground truth data of the point counts. Um, this is just species community matrix, presence, absence, and we've clustered it using unsupervised clustering method. And from now on, all of these colors you see are defined by this graph. So it's quite nice. The riparian reserves have similar community clusters. Lots of the logged forest, uh, the matrix and oil palm all come out. Uh, B1 is actually by a stream, which is nice that this sort of, you know, we just got the data and let it tell us that it's similar to riparian. And then I went and asked Yanni, I was like, oh, it's B1 by a stream, by the way. She's like, yeah, it is. So good. It comes out in our species community. Now using those machine learned features on our audio, P equals naught, ignore that. I'm quite embarrassed. I need to change this. Um, but uh, we did the same thing with our audio set features over the course of 24 hours at each of our sites. And you get very similar clusters. So these colors, again, are defined by that species community clustering. And we did some mutual information sort of shuffling and then a measure of mutual information before, between this cluster and that cluster. And you're not going to get this. It's, it's far from random. It's very like what you're getting out from the audio actually correlates very well with what you get from species community clustering. Uh, 
again, you can sort of do sanity checks here. Matrix and all the palm come out in the same one, and old growth and some of the better log forest clusters. Uh, so again, this is just one mean audio feature over 24 hours using these machine learning features. And then, just as a sort of benchmark, I used those handcrafted features that people in soundscape science traditionally use, and it's rubbish. Like, you know, you don't get any sort of near significant clustering. And, you know, things like matrix sounds similar to old growth doesn't quite, you know, add up. Uh, then we just sort of took our 24 hours of data from each of our sites with these machine learned features, and we did a reduced dimensionality plot. UMAP is a better version of TSNE, which is a better version of PCA. It's just a reduced dimensions of the 128 features at each site. And the size of each dot here corresponds to the above ground biomass of the plot. And so you see quite nicely on the first dimension, it separates sites with water sounds to those that are not. And you listen to the sounds, and it's quite obvious that there's a stream. It's just quite like kind of background white noise. And then the second dimension actually really nicely teases out this above ground biomass gradient through our site. So this is completely unsupervised, this dimensionality reduction. And we're getting that the major axis that our audio changes across the safe landscape is across this above ground biomass within our sampling strategy. Same thing done with our benchmark things. And it, you know, it doesn't, uh, I haven't done any predictions here that will get to that on the next site. But again, it doesn't look so clean. You, you listen and you know what the field's like, and then you can see that, and it doesn't really add up. Here I've done some predictions. So taking uh, the mean feature vector at each of our sites over 24 hours, I've said, can I predict the above ground biomass at this site? So doing some sort of leave on out cross validation, basically, I say for this site, ignore this site when I train my model, just a simple linear regression. Um, what can I, can I predict where this site would lie? So true value of above ground biomass and predicted value, you get quite a nice trend. And as I said, I'm using some really simple models just because linear stats is nice to talk about and easy to interpret. But if you actually wanted to do this, you, I'm sure you could get better results out. Similarly, with those handcrafted features, you just don't. Uh, OK, so now to the exciting bit that we're working on right now. It's not a bioacoustics talk without a poor tree falling over. Uh, if a tree falls in the forest and we record it, how can we find it? So we've got vast amounts of information coming from all of these recorders that are through the safe landscape, right? I've got 14 recording sites with 24-7 for months and months and months. What, where do I even start looking at this data beyond just simple sort of correlating with ground truth data? Um, really what it boils down to is an anomaly detection kind of problem and we want it to be recorder specific so say I've got a recorder in oil palm near a road a car moving by it isn't a weird sound but something in the middle of say VJR if there's a car moving by it quite close you know that's that's important fully unsupervised just again because it makes the whole pipeline a lot, a lot more scalable and lets the data do the talking rather than you having to Every time you make a new recorder, you have to do something new. And actually, the cool applications for ecology of sort of illegal poaching and logging detection, the chainsaw doesn't sound like anything you normally hear in a forest. Uh, but also, you know, rare species, if you've never had an elephant in this site before and you hear an elephant, you want to flag that up to someone who's listening on the other side or just a sensor failure. The kind of approach to this, again, without getting too deep into the maths, is this is 65 days of audio data from one recorder in VJR. What we've done is we've taken the features and colored them by hour of day. So this is 6 AM, 7 AM, right down to 3, 4 PM. And then there's the dusk chorus, that's nighttime. Then there's a dawn chorus. So this is all just an unsupervised dimensionality reduction. But you see this nice. I found the world's most complicated way of discovering a dawn chorus, really. Um, and then <laughs> what you do is you listen to audio that lies within these really high density regions. And it's good. It's just really boring nighttime audio. There's nothing special going on, right? And then you do the same at daytime. And you're like, oh, there's, there's lots of audio that's similar to that. It sounds like audio I might hear at that time. Oh. Um, but the exciting bit is then, you say you have a new bit of audio. You stick it through your same features, your same dimensionality reduction, and it falls out here in some one of these anomalous regions. You're like, synthetic. Don't worry, we haven't heard this at safe. But <laughs> okay, but that's the idea. You build a probability distribution around your data, and you can do knowledge detection from that. In summary, lots of data, habitat quality can be predicted. We're looking at anomaly detection, 
and overall, it's a good route to go down. Thank you. <laughs>